Hi, good evening, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another installment of From the Clinic to the Living Room. My name is Melissa, in case you've never joined us before. I am the Aim at Melanoma Ask an Expert. Um, we do these sort of talks once a month. Um, tonight's topic is the microbiome, which I'm super excited to talk about. If you saw my live video this morning, um, the nerd in me is screaming with joy right now. Um, essentially, um, we're going to talk about the microbiome. What is it? Why is it important? Sort of how you know things kind of tie in through the immune system, and also how it relates to melanoma. Um, at the end, we're going to give some tips on how to nurture your microbiome and make it work best for you. Um, a couple of things, just quickly, um, in the comment section. Um, let me know where you're watching from. Let me know if you have questions. I will try very hard to, as we go along, answer some questions if we're in the topic, if we are past it. Um, I'll try to handle some of those things at the end. Um, you know, keep your questions to the microbiome and, and things like that because that's what we're talking about tonight. There are questions that you want to reach me with outside of this, you know, conversation. Um, there's various ways on the AIM and Melanoma website that you can get a hold of me either by filling out the online form, calling the one eight seven seven number. Um, someone will get you in touch with me if you need me. So, um, you know, one of the other things that I want to do really quickly is just say, um, as a disclaimer, I am not a nutritionist. I am not a microbiologist. I am not a GI physician. <laughs> and I also, um, you know, I'm not trying to prescribe a certain way that you should eat. So um, I spent probably the last three weeks just reading so much about the microbiome. And the further I got into the subject, um, the more I was really fascinated by it. Um, and so this is sort of a compilation of hours and hours and hours of reading journal articles and condensing them down into hopefully a 30 minute or less talk. So um, here we go. So essentially the microbiome, it is very literally the collection of trillions, trillions of microbes that live in and on the human body. Um, just as a sort of idea of how many that is, if you took all the microbes that are growing on you and you shove them into one big giant pile, it would weigh about six pounds. The brain, the average human brain weighs four pounds. So that's a ton of bacteria, fungi, viruses, things that are actually living on and in our bodies. Um, but they're good. So these bacteria by and large, or these microbes by and large are good. They work in what's called symbiosis. So we're, you know, a big community trying to work together for the common goal of taking care of our bodies. Essentially, um, it's not random. Um, the, the microbes live in certain aspects of our, our body because of their function. Um, it's very easy and I like to think of the microbiome sort of as your own little ecosystem. So it's all the things, if you remember from you know elementary school and learning about ecosystems, it's all the things that sort of make your community run or your little ecosystem run the way that it's supposed to. So when that happens, you all work together and it's called symbiosis. Um, we do for them, they do for us. When your bacteria or your microbiome is in array and, and there's bad bacteria that are overcrowding the good bacteria and things are not working the way that they're supposed to, that's something or a term called dysbiosis. So just to get a couple of the vocabulary words sort of out there so that when I say them later, you'll know what they mean. Um, everyone's microbiome is unique to them. It's your own little fingerprint. So when you're in the womb of your mom, you're sterile actually, um, and you acquire your microbiome both by the birth canal, by breastfeeding, by the things that you eat, the environments you come in contact with. Um, so as you can imagine, everyone's microbiome is a little bit different. For example, you know, my brothers and I grew up in the same house. Our parents cooked the same meals. Um, we were exposed to the same, for the most part, germs growing up, but I stayed in Pittsburgh. My brother moved to Ohio to go to college. Um, my other brother stayed in our home. So all of us have a very unique environment and, and microbes that we were exposed to that now are part of our own little ecosystem. Um, microbiomes have jobs. So in our specific talk tonight, we're going to talk about the gut microbiome because that's essentially um, you know, what is being used um, for research dealing with both immunotherapy in all cancers, but also um, specifically in melanoma. 
So in reference to the gut microbiome, some you know microbes have the job of making vitamins. Some of them aid in digestion. Some of them help guide brain development and sort of signal with the gut brain access um, to help us, you know, process the foods that we're eating. So it's a very complex system. Um, And in fact, in all the studying that they've done in this, you know, microbiome study, they they don't really know a lot of the exact mechanisms of how these work. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, And it's also sort of why why it's so difficult to actually um, pinpoint the exact things that we need to do and eat and alter um, to make everyone's gut microbiome the exact same and healthy. Um, It would kind of be impossible um, because there are a lot of things that can cause changes like your diet and the food that you eat, your environment, your genetics. um, And also, you know, the world that we live in is very antibacterial. We use antibacterial soaps. We use all these cleaners with harsh chemicals. And um, there's a lot of there's a lot of bacteria that are be- being killed off and our microbiomes are actually deficient in a lot of microbes that we had 50 years ago um, because of the you know, antibacterial environment that we have now. Um, one thing that they did find, and, and studies have been going on um, majorly since 2005, but probably even before that, um, that have been trying to understand and study the microbiome. One of the largest programs um, is the United States, the U.S. Human Microbiome Project. Um, even though it has the title, you know, the United States in the title, um, this is a global international participation and um, collaboration um, with participants both inside and outside of the United States and, and internationally. Um, they're trying to find out what constitutes a healthy microbiome. What can we do to alter and repair it? Because really that's the key Um, you know, not only do we need to understand what makes it healthy, but we need to understand what can we do to fix it if it's not healthy. Um, Because since this data is relatively new, a lot of us have been eating a lot of really terrible things for most of our life, um, myself included. Um, So how can I fix my microbiome once it's broken? So that's sort of where a lot of this data um, is coming from. So when you look at the microbiome and the gut microbiome, there's, there's generally three types of participants. There are the quiet participants that sort of do their own thing. They take up space. They keep intruders in check. Um, There's the friendlies, um, which we want around. These are the ones that help influence our immune system and help help it differentiate what's good and what's bad. And then we have the harmers. The harmers of the microbiome actually do harm to the environment. They activate the immune system. They harm um, the immune system both at a local level and then eventually a global level. Um, a little bit more about the, um, you know, what I kept reading over and over again in a lot of, of the articles that I read were that you are what you eat. So, um, you know, as an example, the things that you put inside your gut, which goes from your mouth to your anus, um, essentially will influence not only the things you crave, um, but it'll directly influence your immune system in terms of inflammation and things like that, which we're going to talk about a little bit how, you know, your gut bacteria sort of an immune system sort of interact. Um, but you really are what you eat. So the microbes that grow in your intestines are a direct result of, of the things that you put in it. Um, so you have, you know, bacteria, microbes that like vegetables, you have microbes that like fatty acids, you have microbes that like processed food, you have microbes that, flourish in a high fat environment. So all of these things are sort of intermingling and they all have different ramifications and different jobs based upon what they're exposed to. Um, The harmers tend to be things like alcohol, fatty ass, things that are really, really high in fat, processed foods, um, some animal proteins. And part of that is sort of due to um, not only that they're difficult to digest, but they also sometimes are loaded with things that manufacturers or farmers or whatever give them to allow them to be shipped and processed and grow bigger and stronger, et cetera, et cetera. Linda, you don't have to give up ice cream. We'll get to that. (laughs) Um, So when you have harmers, you end up with an overcrowding of bad things um, and they push out the parts of your microbe that are actually good. what happens is you have this 
very thin layer in your gut, which is called the epithelium, and it's tight packed. So it's, you know, cells and cells kind of packed next to each other. And it's sort of like a fence. So it separates your microbes from your immune system, essentially, without getting too specific. When that happens, when you put harmers in there, they start banging up against the fence, in theory. So you have to go along with this as like an analogy. So they start banging up inside the fence and the fence you know, boards start to get a little farther apart. And then it allows the immune system to um, be activated by these harmers, by these things that your body sees as foreign. And when that happens, um, what it does is it actually not only um, directly causes an increase in lymphoid tissue, uh, but it also sort of, it activates T cells, it activates B cells, it activates macrophages. And these things, if you go back to my YouTube channel or the YouTube channel with um, AIM, um, there's other videos on there and the, there's one about the immune system and you can kind of see what all these things mean. Um, I'm not gonna go into another explanation of them because that would take another 30 minutes. Um, but there are these things called dendritic cells, which are sort of the presenting part of your immune system. And when it encounters bad microbes, um, it makes an antigen and it presents it to the rest of the immune cells. And so what happens is these activated dendritic cells um, cause T regulatory cells to not function properly. So the, the job of the T regulatory cells, which by the way, 100% are contained within your gut bacteria or your gut microbiome, um, what its job, what the T regulatory cells very simply do is they tell your immune system to calm down. So they release IL, a molecule or a, a cytokine called IL-10, which is anti-inflammatory. So when you have bad bacteria, this process stops. And so it causes, it actually causes a local, but a systemic inflammation. And, and this at its very basic level is why, um, scientists feel that inflammatory conditions um, are directly related to the gut microbiome, for one thing. Um, the second thing is over time, with your immune system being activated by the gut, um, it's busy, it gets tired. And so a lot of times the DNA repair that's constantly happening um, is overlooked or if it's not overlooked it's your immune system is just fatigue and it can't it, it can't repair the DNA damage the way that it should aka cancer cells form so um, this harmful microbe that you're mindlessly and really not mindless that's the wrong word but that you have put in your body and you don't realize is doing damage is, is occultly doing damage both at a local and a systemic level that can have ramifications down the road. So um, that's a big problem. So this dysbiosis causes inflammation, which causes a systemic alert system to be activated, which then causes more inflammation. So it's just this sort of cycle. The really interesting thing is part of the gut brain access also makes us crave the things that are present. So if you have more vegetable loving bacteria or microbes in your gut, you're gonna crave more vegetables to feed them. If you have more processed food microbes in your gut, you're gonna actually crave those things as well. So it's, it's this sort of like circle of, of cravings and your gut doing bad things and your brain telling it it's okay. Um, that can get really out of control. Um, the more that you lose the happy bacteria in your gut, um, you lose short chain fatty acids. And why that's important is that short chain fatty acids are also anti-inflammatory. Um, when you do that, you get an abundance of what are called basophilic bacteria, which are like bowel salts, which are essentially poison. So that's no good. Um, Tracy, we'll get to the whole supplement part later, so just stay tuned. We're getting there. Um, okay, so I lost my train of thought. Um, okay, so in all of the research that is being done and all the projects that are being centered around the, the gut microbiome, 
what they have found is that they feel that some of the diseases in our life are increasing because our microbiomes are becoming less diverse. So we don't have as many varying microbes to do their specific job. They're being like, ex you know, put out of out to pasture. They're extinct now. And so um, that's one thing that actually when we look at how we repair the gut microbiome, we have to increase the diversity. Um, when you look at um, the immune system in general, um, one of the things that you know scientists found kind of across the board is that the number one way to increase diversity is to actually increase fiber. Um, every study that I that I came across at the major academic centers that are looking at um, how does the gut microbiome in melanoma um, apply? Um, found that diversity is the most important thing. Um, each academic center sort of found different varying bacteria that were found in the you know patients who responded to immunotherapy. Um, you know the bacteria that the you know West Coast found was very different than the Southwest, which was very different than what was found in the East Coast studies. Um, part of that may have to do with the regions that the folks live in and the vegetables and fruits and produce and animals that they have access to, um, the soil that's different, um, the environment that's different. So there's a lot of, a lot of factors that sort of went into, um, I think the differences between the, the bacteria that were found in the responder guts versus the non-responders. Um, but one thing that was by far the most consistent was that diversity was really the key. Um, and they all agreed that increasing fiber, you're right, Tracy, fiber is our best friend. Increasing fiber actually was the most beneficial of all. So um, one study out of Nature, um, which is you know fairly large, well-respected journal um, in 2007 did this really cool experiment where for five days they fed people a, a completely plant-based diet, um, which obviously would be very high in fiber. And they measured microbiomes daily. So they had stool samples daily. They analyzed what was in it and all of that jazz. What they found was that on the plant days, um, there was a significant increase in short chain fatty acids and a very big decrease in inflammation. And on the days that they, so then after that five days, they fed them entirely meat or um, um, animal-based products, meat diet. Um, and what they found was that there was a significant increase in bio-loving bacteria. There was, a, or I'm sorry, there was an increase in bio-loving bacteria, so an increase in bile salts, which as we already established is like poison. There was an increase in inflammation. There was a decrease in the plant bacteria that they had just established in the five days prior in just 24 hours. Um, and they also saw some um, increased bacterial antibiotic resistance in just those five days. So there's a huge shift in the microbiome. It's adapting all the time. So even just in 24 hours or five days, um, the gut microbiome can drastically change. So, um, you know, it's, it's constantly adapting to what we're expo exposing it to. Um, one of the interesting things that this study also identified is that um, like the American diet in general is like 60% processed foods. So things that allow things to stay on the shelf, um, allow it to stay um, fresh for people to use, convenience products are all processed. So um, processed foods is about 60% of the diet, plant-based, you know, plant intake is about 10% of the diet um, and um, animal proteins like um, meat, eggs, and dairy account for about 30% of the diet. Um, just by decreasing processed foods, we see a significant increase in good microbio, um, microbiota. So if you did nothing else, but decrease your intake of processed foods, you already are helping yourself in terms of keeping your gut bacteria healthy. Um, processed foods 
are basically useless. They prevent you sometimes from even getting the nutrients that you need. So if you're eating a lot of processed foods, but you're also eating fruits and vegetables, it's almost like canceling itself out. So um, if nothing else, take a look at your processed food intake and see if that's really actually important. Um, also things that can affect the microbiome are antibiotics. So excessive use of antibiotics can actually decrease the microbiome and they and in some of these melanoma studies, they found that folks that were on antibiotics um, during immunotherapy actually had some decrease in their response. And so, um, you know, a lot of a lot of what is being shifted in terms of looking at how the microbiome is related to response is going to, I think, in the next you know, several years become an extremely important um, part of treatment. Um, they're looking now at doing, I mean, and these big academic centers have done fecal transplants in, you know, taking responder stool and putting it in a non-responder to see if they can gain a response. Um, in a mouse model, this works. So taking stool from a non-responder and putting it in a responder causes tumor decrease. It causes a significant change in the microbiome, which then in turn also causes a response clinically. And so you'll see a lot more of these clinical trials, I think, becoming a lot more mainstream. Um, I know when at our center, when we started talking to people about doing fecal transplants, they thought we were crazy. They, you want me to when we take someone else's stool and put it in my body, that sounds insane. Um, there are other ways to deliver this. There are, you know, laboratory made um, ways to give bacteria to these folks. But the problem is they don't know exactly what strains you need because it seemed to vary between center to center. So um, look for that as part of, you know, studies that are coming down the pike for sure. Um, one of the other things that was a huge factor in responses in melanoma patients is stress. So decreasing stress um, really helps. You know, they, they found that cortisol weakens the lining of the gut. Um, it also increases inflammatory cytokines. So, um, you know, it's really not easy to stay calm and not be stressed out whenever you are looking at melanoma and stage four and treatment and navigating your, your therapy, um, but trying to use techniques to, um, you know, decrease stress and decrease those cortisol levels, meditation, exercise, relaxation, things are all very important. So these are all things that can directly affect the microbiome, um, which in turn can help um, keep it healthy. So um, there was a question that I wanted to address real quick. Connie, um, Fiber does not help fight melanoma, so don't be confused. I'm sorry if that's the message that you're taking. Fiber helps keep the gut microbiome very, very healthy. Um, the more fiber um, that patients were taking in, the more healthy their microbiome is. And what studies are showing is that healthy microbiomes correlate to better responses in immunotherapy. So there's not a direct relationship by this is what you eat and you get a response in melanoma. That's not the case. And there is not a diet for melanoma. There is nothing that is going from A to point B that doesn't exist. So I get that question all the time from the Ask an Expert hotline. You know, is there a melanoma diet? The answer is no, there isn't. Um, there's no clinical trial or scientific research that supports a specific diet for treating melanoma that just is not the case. Now with all of the information that we have about the gut microbiome, yes, Ed, we did, I have read all of the stuff from Dr. Wargo and every all the other institutions that are doing microbiome work. Um, one of the things that is very important is finding a way to keep your gut microbiome as healthy as possible. Increase fiber, decrease processed foods. Um, do you have to be a vegan to do this? From what I've seen, no. Um, you know, folks that really enjoy eating meat, decrease your meat intake a little bit. It's okay. Um, but really, the most important things, decrease processed foods, increase fiber, decrease stress. Those are the best things that you can do for yourself from what I've read. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about how do we do this? How do we increase fiber in our gut, which would then increase diversity? Um, one way that you can do that is the diversity of the plants that you eat. So the diversity of the fiber. Um, essentially, most of the American population is deficient in fiber in general. Um, most, the average American gets about 15 to 18 grams of fiber. What's actually recommended for women is 25 grams, for men it's 38 grams. Um, that's huge deficits. Um, in order to get diversity, a good goal would be about 30 different varieties of primarily plant-based fiber, if possible. Um, if you're doing that, fiber and plants are our friends. Um, if you're doing that and you're getting 30 varieties of fiber in your diet and you're eating you know, a low processed food diet, if you have pizza every once in a while or ice cream or um, your favorite thing is to eat, steak hoagies once a week, um, it's not the end of the world because you're still giving your gut microbiome a very diverse level of helpful anti-inflammatory microbes to work with. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. So here are the things, um, and you really wanna try to get some of these in your diet every week if possible, but here are the things that I found constituted when I delved into what makes a diverse, happy gut, um, these are the things that kept coming up. So um, there's an acronym that has come up a couple places and I'm not trying to steal anyone's fire from the internet, so I apologize if, if this is not okay to share your information, but um, there was an acronym that I thought was really nice. It's called F goals, so fiber goals. Um, the F stands for fruits and fermented things like pickles and sauerkraut, kombucha, those types of, you know, pickle beets, things that are fermented, um, and fruits with skin. So that was a very important thing in order to get the nutrients and the fiber, you really wanna eat the skins of the, of the fruits, and that applies to vegetables as well. Um, so goals, G stands for greens, so green leafy vegetables, broccoli, and also like cabbage, broccoli, spinach, kale, all of the things that we think of are, you know, as greens, um, and whole grains. Whole grains are actually really important um, as part of the entire microbe um, workup or ecosystem. You don't want to avoid carbohydrates altogether. Grains are actually a very important part of what you need. Um, so not processed grains, so not bleached flour, um, really whole grains, brown rice, grainy breads, whole wheat, um, oatmeal, flaxseed, things like that. Um, the O stands for omega-3, and this can take the forms of things like chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds. Um, that's really where a lot of the omega-3s um, fish, if you're not doing a completely vegan diet, um, omega-3 fatty acids are actually really good for the microbes. Um, then there's aromatics, so things like shallots, garlic, onions. So you can see that getting 30 diverse um, fiber-based foods is actually not that hard if you eat a varied diet and don't eat box food all the time. So that's, that's actually not very hard. Um, the L stands for legumes or beans. Um, one of the things that I learned, unfortunately, from doing this diet for the last two weeks is you don't, if you're not used to eating things like beans, which can be a little bit difficult and on sensitive tummies, is don't try to throw them in your diet in abundance <laughs> um, every day um, because that hurts your belly and causes a lot of gas and it, it can be very <laughs> uncomfortable. So um, don't do what I did and jump in with beans head first. Um, you should incorporate them a little more slowly into your diet if that's what, you know, one of the fiber-based foods you're going to incorporate. Um, and also the S stands for shrooms. So shrooms, also seaweed. Um, so sea vegetables. Um, and also, and <laughs> I get this question a lot too, the S can also stand for sulforaphane. So sulforaphane um, is a phytochemical. Um, it's found in things like broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. Um, there actually is a prevention study um, at the University of Pittsburgh that's looking at sulforaphane um, to prevent melanoma. Um, and so 
sulforaphane is it's a cancer crusher so it's a powerful antioxidant um, and one of the places that you can find this in the greatest abundance is something called broccoli sprouts um, there have been a lot of questions and people ask a ton of uh, for information about broccoli sprouts and if broccoli sprouts prevent melanoma the answer is no right now um, but broccoli sprouts are part of your microbiome that actually can be anti-inflammatory, antioxidants, and anti-cancer. So it's never bad to add broccoli sprouts if you have them. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to just quickly reiterate again is that this is not a diet that cures melanoma. So my goal tonight was just to try to find, you know, what is the microbiome? Because you're going to see this coming up. How does it affect the immune system? And then I delved into my own research of trying to find out how could I, how could I increase my own microbiome and what are the things that you can do to actually you know, help yourself. And from the major academic centers, we know that people with diverse microbiomes do better with immunotherapy. So you know, the goal of tonight really is just to make sure that everyone... Um, has a little bit of an understanding of how you can you can help yourself. Um, so when I get that question, you know, moving forward, I'm going to say no, there isn't a diet, but here are the things that you can maybe do to help yourself. If anything, um, outside of melanoma, having a healthy microbiome has been shown to decrease anxiety and depression because of the gut brain access. Um, there there are chemicals that um, specific things in your gut actually can trigger dopamine and um, epinephrine and serotonin which you know can make you happy <laughs> so the gut microbiome has been linked to um, improving anxiety and treating anxiety and depression ADHD autism um, dysbiosis in the immune system has been or I'm sorry in the gut microbiome has been linked to things like rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory conditions like eczema, psoriasis, diabetes, coronary artery disease. So, um, and they've also, conversely, studies have shown that fixing the microbiome or increasing the diversity um, can actually reduce these things. So, it can't hurt. Um, in general, it can make you feel better. So, I've been doing or following this diversity microbiome way of living and eating for the last about two to three weeks, I will tell you I'm sleeping better. I am feeling much more energetic. Um, my mood's improved, whether that's from sleeping or not, I don't know. Um, my skin is clearer. I feel like I have a clearer head. Um, my joints don't ache quite as much. So I'm finding in the short term a lot of benefits just in in a few weeks of changing some of these things. Am I cutting out carbohydrates? No. Am I not eating ice cream? No. I'm just increasing my fiber. So let me look back and see if we can have any of these questions. I see a lot of people asking a lot of things. Um, Ed, I can't read your article because I can't look at it while I'm seeing this. Um, is there a test to determine what our microbiome is lacking? I think that there are, um, well, at least I've found that you can send samples of your stool to find out what your food sensitivities and things like that are. Um, I don't think that any of them, from what I can see, are necessarily validated. Um, I do know that if you have food sensitivities, that can be a sign that you have a little bit of dysbiosis in your gut microbiome. There are actually functional medicine doctors that specialize um, in these things. So um, there are plenty of places that you can actually go um, to have these evaluations done. Um, so um, Nicole, I, you know, I'm sure that we could find functional medicine nutrition doctors in your area if you, if you want to contact me on um, the Ask an Expert line. Um, Tracy, you say I've taken three immunotherapies <sighs> when you're on immunotherapy, focus on the gut. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, 
It's just real quickly, I'm scrolling through. If there's something that you want to know that I didn't cover here, again, because I'm not, you know, a nutrition expert, um, you know, please feel free to call the Ask an Expert hotline. Um, please feel free to um, reach out to me, you know, with the form on the website. I'm happy to an answer any of those questions. Um, Matt, you said, is fiber from whole grains or brands okay to do, or do you rec recommend mainly fruits and vegetables? Actually, I think we kind of covered that. Um, you want to do grains and fruits and vegetables and fruits and all beans and all of that. So it's diversity. So you don't want to eat just broccoli or just cauliflower or whatever you want a variety. So try to set a goal for like 30 fruit, 30 different varieties of fiber um, a week. Um, I think that pretty much is gonna wrap it up. I didn't see too many, um, too many different questions. So thank you again for tuning in. Again, if you have other things that you wanna know, I literally probably could have talked about this for another hour. Um, I'm happy to talk about it more um, if you contact the Ask an Expert um, hotline or fill the form out for me to you know, come and, and speak to you. Um, if you have any other things that you need, let me know. Thanks for watching. I think a month from now we're going to talk about clinical trials just to let you know what's coming um, because I think that it's important to know, you know, what does it mean when you're on a clinical trial? What can I expect? What things can I look, look to? Like what's going to happen to me? What are the expectations? What are the differences between the different phases of clinical trials? So I think we're going to talk about that next month. So if you have any suggestions or specific questions you want to know from that, feel free to post them here. I'll, I'll try to incorporate them when I'm planning um, my next talk. All right. Thanks again for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time.